so to open the case that stands in their name here here uh, hi before i start just to check uh, can everybody hear me i can yes okay uh, i'm just going to set my timer and then Starting in three, two, one. Just to give you an account of what the world looks like in our model is that we will have International Space Agency, for instance, giving lots of money or being given more money to explore space. But we're also perfectly fine with uh, countrywide organizations like NASA or local space agencies, like the Chinese Space Agency, also giving much more money. We want more money for these agencies instead of them being defunded as they are in being in the status quo. There are three benefits that we get, regardless of whatever this debate is about, that I think are essential to talk uh, about in the speech. The first thing that we get is necessarily innovation. I want you to note, panel, that things like GPS, the fact that you have microwaves right now, the fact that you have satellites, television, all of this was born out of the space race that happened during the Cold War. So what I want you to note is that even if we don't find another planet where we can live, at the very least, what we get is a shit ton of potential benefits from investing into this. And this leads to a lot more innovation on our side of the house. So there are actual material benefits to life, even if we don't find another planet to live in. The second thing I want you to note is that we get a whole new generation of scientists on our side of the house where kids actually want to be the next Neil Armstrong, perhaps, or other kinds of things. Why? Because I want you to note that there are new and important things being discovered. And I want you to note that space science isn't particularly developed. So there's a lot more room for you to find out more things as opposed to the natural world, which has largely, um, I mean, there are certain uncertainties here as well, but largely been thought of or talked about in academia. The second thing I want you to note is for you to get a whole new generation of scientists, you also need a shit ton of money being present for them to operate in this world. And we give them their money by increasing funding. The third thing I want you to note is that there is a potential common enemy such as Thanos out there. And what this leads to is at the very least is political unity because of that common enemy being present. Having talked about this, what are the problems on the planet and why do we think that this is an essential thing for us to do? I want you to note that Earth is not infinitely habitable for three key reasons. One, I think the fact of climate change is ever present. Most scientists believe that we are too far gone and also believe that certain effects of climate change cannot be reversed. So the fact that your average temperature is 1.5 degrees up, which means your ice caps will be melting, even if not at a faster pace, they'll still continue to melt. You might not be able to grow crops as, as well as you were before, so on and so forth. But the second thing I want you to note is that there are oftentimes economic incentives to not prevent climate change from exacerbating. And I think that humanity is finding it very difficult to do that in the status quo, especially given how developing countries need their economies to function. The second thing I want you to note within this argument is also the fact of overpopulation, which is the fact that oftentimes states do encourage people to reproduce less, but Pakistanis like Hamza and I don't listen to them and have four or five kids each. We think that the problem with this then is you oftentimes don't have space to accommodate people, which means that they live shit lives in slums and so on and so forth. Oftentimes don't have jobs because you are limited by things like limited resources on the planet, limited production capacity, so on and so forth. Or in the worst case scenarios, dictatorial policies, which actually try to limit how much children that you can have. We can see policies like that in China or previously in India with Indira Gandhi. And we think that that's a huge problem on their end. And the third thing I want you to note is it's not entirely plausible that Earth will live on forever. We might be, get hit by an asteroid in the future. The sun might run out of their, run out of its cells and become black star or whatever. I think there are lots of reasons for why Earth might not exist in the future. And the possibility of Earth might not existing in the future is something that means that we must invest in this. What are the essential things that we get on our side of the house that I don't think these guys would ever be able to get on theirs? The first thing I want you to note is of in, in the past, this is just like a natural historic progression of science, right? In the past, the Atlantic was something that wasn't conceived to be something that you could cross. What we envision is a world where you can make five hour trips across planets. And I think that that uh, opens up a vast amounts of like benefits on our side of the house. The first thing I want you to note, what does space give you that the planet fucking can't? One, infinite resources. The planet does not have mineral resources. Like obviously space has more planets, therefore more resources, uh, process analysis done. The second thing I want you to note also is that there are no opportunity costs. Right now you have 
actual fucking wars over mineral resources because in order for you to get a mineral resource it often means taking it away from someone else so at the very least what we prevent is at the worst like conflicts over i don't know even things like water or other carbon carbon resources or whatever in their world the second thing i want you to note within this argument for why this is essential is also the fact that habitable planets exist on their on our side of the house which is to say that almost always there's like well, some proof for carbon uh, based life existing otherwise uh, some planets being more habitable than earth i think why this is important is because earth might actually not be the best possible planet for humanity to live on we might be able to function better in a planet have longer lives perhaps in a planet with more resources more oxygen i don't know what how these planets function hamza can go through the science the third thing i want you to note within this is also the fact that often times there is an existential threat which is the scientific community largely agrees on one simple fact which is there is almost 100% probability or i don't know 90% probability that there is intelligent life out there somewhere there are billions of planets which host carbon based life why is this a problem one just virtually like some somebody might be a threat to you and might have possess more technology than you and have the ability to wipe out your species but before that i'll take um, a poi from closing are you willing to colonize currently inhabited planets by aliens i mean i don't think we we necessarily need to because again infinite resources other planets but like if they're really shit and they have lots of resources why not um okay so about habitable planets is one like one you need to you need to be able to protect yourself from the threat but for you to be able to protect yourself from the threat you need to know that one the, the threat exists two you need to know how big of a threat it is and what their technological capacities are and i think that we need to fund this but the second thing i want you to notice even if they are not a threat and they're kind of nice like lsea then what you do get is the potential for technological transfers right things like learning about new things that they're doing i think what this does is it gets you a lot of material benefit fits on the ground by virtue of you getting lots of technologies that can benefit lots of people i want to engage with two things over here which we think might come from opposition one the the argument that you should put this money into poverty projects or whatever i would note that our facts of innovation a whole new generation of scientists investing in science or you finding out more finding out more mineral resources in in the future in these planets means that you are able to protect your people more but also give them more material wealth and a chance at a better life in this world the second thing i want you to note is with regards to access we say even if developing countries can't access space to the same degree that the united states of america or china can at the very least what they do get benefits from are the scientific papers that you publish but secondly also that the, the technologies that you publish the technologies that get democratized and and, and the technologies that the people in mtp have access to for all these reasons very proud to propose We thank the speaker for the fine speech, and would now like to call upon the leader of opposition. Here, here. Hi. Um. Can you hear me? You are a bit faint. Um. But can hear you. Okay. Um. Is this better? Yeah. Just a bit. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Give me a moment. Um right starting in 3 to 1 So I think the only thing more unbelievable than the supposed benefits that Taha talks about is the fact that it's too fucking AM and I'm supposed to debate <laughs> the likelihood of space and like what we can get all of this and incredible hypothetical but I think there's two things I want to prove to you in opening opposition the first is that, um, that if we have a duty towards individuals in the here and now we should protect these individuals specifically but second why I think the space race is just going to lead to a net harm for humanity directly responding to the stuff that Taha talks about in that speech first let's talk about duties right and the first thing I want to recognize is actually that there is a fundamental trade off that needs to exist in this debate because there are a lot of things that require like In, in our society, they require the kind of money and opportunity cost that is going to be lost on that side of the house. We are talking about incredible amounts of funding that can otherwise go into infrastructure. They can otherwise go into doing things like solving student debt. 
uplifting communities in the develop in the in the developing world that desperately need this funding to ha- to exist. That means that the comparative on that side of the house is actual death and destruction at a point they are not able to uplift these individuals from the existential threat that they face on a day to day basis. But more than that, I think in terms of research and development, the limited genius that we have in the world, the fact that there's a limited scientific capacity to carry out this research means that R and D that is used for the space race could otherwise be used for other problems like natural disaster mitigation, like geo engineering to actually solve the kind of climate change issues that we have today. The definite avoidance of massive harm is what we think we can achieve. I recognize that this argument is not the most intellectually interesting, but if there's one thing I've learned this year is that intellectual interesting arguments don't necessarily win debates. I think this is important for you to admit. But I also want to recognize that on that side of the house, there's a very significant an opportunity cost, right? Because all the stuff that Taha talks about are by definition uncertain. Space is big. It takes incredibly long to traverse these areas in space, so much so that um, the movie Passengers are made on that basis. And that means that it's incredibly uncertain on that side. How's the degree of benefit that they are going to get? The, because First, because of the time, uh, time and distance, but second, because of the uncertainty of space, which means that incredible amounts of money are necessarily poured into projects that ultimately go to waste on that side of the house, which means that the amount of cost that they bear for each particular benefit is uncertain and incredibly large, right? Things like aliens are not, uh, like things like aliens, things like Earth not necessarily existing are fundamentally and by definition uncertain. Where do our moral obligations lie, therefore? We think they lie in terms of protecting individuals in the short term for five reasons. The first is that on that side of the house, there's a good, there's an incredible possibility that you are trading off people in the now for absolutely nothing. We suggest that that morally means that that, that their, their lives become worth no more than the toss of the dice, and we suggest that that is fundamentally immoral. But secondly, I want to note the scale of potential harm that exists. Right On our side of the house, we suggest the definitive harm that actually is going to wipe out individuals' existence is an incredibly significant harm that you should not ever be able to trade off. But the third reason, and this is important, because the global poor are groups that we fucked over with the capitalist system, that we structurally choose not to care about, that we create structures of exclusion from from basic goods and necessities that structurally are the reason why these individuals are poor in the status quo. Four, I think the reality that, the, that is we can't trade these individuals off because these specific individuals will never access these benefits on your side of the house at the point that they are dead. And that suggests that they need to be treated as moral ends. You cannot claim that future benefit to other individuals is worth trading off these individuals, even if you didn't believe that they were uniquely vulnerable and we had unique obligations to them. But the fifth thing to note is that I think there's an immediate, is that the immediacy concern is important for two reasons. So a lot of the harms they talk about accrue at best to future generations. One, we think that to the degree that they don't exist yet, and to the degree that like the prim, the exact uh, the ex, like there seems to be an equal um equal possibility that Earth is going to be wiped out before before you actually get into the harms that they suggest we need to avoid means that rationally there is no basis by which to prioritize these future generations in favor of over current generations that we want to protect. But secondly, the, the future generations are premised on current generation assistance. People dying now hurts the unborn future that will never be born. And to that degree, we suggest that there is an immediate concern we need to prioritize. In comparison to this idea of knowledge, the reality is that even where knowledge can be incredibly beneficial, we already limit this based on the ethical limitations we place on scientific experimentation. And the reason for that is the rejection of a pure utilitarian analysis and the recognition that individuals matter in the status quo. Before I move on, I'll take closing. Yeah, so is the average life of the average person going to get better in the next 100 years? And if yes, how and why? Huh? Because if you're dying, I give you a mosquito neck, you don't fucking die. That's a net win for that particular individual. I really don't understand. Second, on this issue of the space race and why I think it's not necessarily good, I want to point out that Taha cannot defend an international-based model because the degree of potential benefit means that there is a natural incentive to and to achieve some exclusivity on the part of each actor, in the same way that nu- nukes, for example, could be removed for net benefit, but each individual de- decides to keep their particular benefit. There are three harms that I think exist on that side of the house. The first is sovereignty, and this due to the idea that you necessarily increase resources drastically. The problem is twofold. The first is that it's hard for you to independently enforce sovereignty in space because that would require third-party actors to enter, but it's unlikely that these third-party actors exist or have the, have the agreeable support to be an independent policeman. The implication of this is that 
privileged countries will, that are able to best reach these spaces first are also the best able to protect these spaces against other individuals. So even if a smaller country gets there first, they have less ability to defend that, which means that things like colonization of certain routes and colonization of all the planets that are useful or the easiest to reach in order to get minerals are likely to happen from the biggest countries. The implication of this is that these countries maximally are able to use that domination and monopoly over these resources to export LDCs in the world today, which means that the benefit of drastically increased access doesn't actually happen, but rather you get increased tension and competition over these limited resources on that side of the house. But the second thing I want to note is that even at a point that resources reach off, it is unlikely that they exist on the large scale of accessibility. And the reason for that is that minerals are likely, because the people who fund these projects can only benefit at the point that they have exclusive access to these minerals and can control the supply of this on earth in order to keep prices high. The implication of this is that at best you're likely to have a catalyzation that limits the access of these rare earth materials to people in the first place. But secondly, note that to the degree that these rare, the use of rare earths on earth, for example, is environmentally unsustainable, you are unlikely to get a significant degree of care for the sustainability of this at the point that you've invested so much in the initial ability to get these resources. Which leads into the third thing, right? Because I think the feeling that we are collectively limited as a, as a species has implications on our collective willingness to coalesce to solve our problems. On that side of the house, on things like environmental, um, environmental protection, the problem is that you legitimize narratives that we can fuck it up more in the status quo because of the potential outroot. But the problem is you have no guarantee that you're able to do to get to space in a way that benefits the majority of people and, lim and ensures that they are all included within this, but also that any of that your technology happens fast enough to reverse the exponentially greater rate as if, at which you're likely to abuse of. The implication of this is that individuals who are left behind in the status quo get disproportionately hurt, but you also kick the can down the road because it's unlikely that you're going to be able to treat space uh, sustainably and you consistently believe that there are so many resources out there, literally the way our forefathers fucked up the earth for us and that we now have to deal with. For those reasons, we're happy to propose. Okay, we thank the speaker for the fine speech and would now like to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. Um, you're a bit faint for me. Is this somewhat better? Uh, a little bit, but Taha was much better, so I don't know what, what you were doing then. Is usually much better. I mean, didn't want to say that, but you know. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Three positive externalities of this motion, which have nothing to do with the efficacy of space exploration. A, you inspire a generation of new scientists. It's not a coincidence that the world's most famous physicists, chemists, and biologists showed up between the 40s and the 80s. It's because when we look up towards the cosmos, we are inspired to partake in science. It's no coincidence that astrophysicists now intersect with physicists, that astrobiologists and astrochemists now intersect with chemistry and biology. This is a positive externality about more science and more scientists which stood independent of the round and received no response. Second positive externality, more innovation. This claim received no response when we showed to you that the fucking microwave that also poor people use, by the way, was it not invented, was invented during the space race. A lot of technologies, because of the uncertainty that opening opposition identified, exist within the realm of science. We have to intersect with biology and chemistry and physics and various other sub-disciplines. This means that it is a lot of knockoff accidental discoveries which significantly improve the well-being of every single individual. The third claim that we had was people work together because it's a common project to get the fuck off this planet and ideally defend ourselves against a potentially superior civilization or just the common goal of looking out towards, towards the cosmos. Their only response to this positive externality was you can't fiat an international organization. Fuck me. The International Space Agency was cooperating between Americans and Russians even during the height of the Cold War. Halfway through the trade war between China and the US, you have Chinese American soldiers literally sharing food on the International Space Agency. If there was ever a unifying project which exists for the human species, it's probably the idea of space exploration. 
Firstly, what I'm going to do is to set the highest possible bar for myself. I'm going to assume, still, this doesn't benefit any people in the present. I'm going to give you five reasons why future generations should be cared about more. A, future generations should be cared about more because they're infinitely more numerate. Every single scientist points out towards the fact that hundreds of billions of us are likely to exist in the future. This claim means that we should care more about the hundreds of billions that will exist in the future on a utilitarian metric than perhaps people in the present. Four other non-utilitarian reasons. A, people in the future have no agency. Just because the accident of birth is spatial doesn't mean it's also not temporal. Just like you don't choose to be where, to, don't decide where to be born, you also don't decide when to be born. In fact, people in the future have less agency because they're constrained by the past dependencies of the things that we do in the present. Three, every single human obligation that we have, for instance, towards animal rights, towards racial equality, towards the environment, are necessarily long-term obligations. If we want to fulfill those obligations, we necessarily need to guarantee the long-term prospects of the human species. Number four, this deals directly with the uncertainty point. If you're going to argue that it's uncertain what the long-term benefits are, I'm going to argue that your current actions might have uncertain consequences, right? So for instance, if you help poor people now, it might lead to a genocide 50,000 years from now because the butterfly effect exists. So uncertainty is completely symmetric on both sides. The fifth thing that I want to point out that I think is equally important is to do with obligations. Past generations have guaranteed that we have better well-being in our present, which is their future. It is equally our obligation to invest in the future to make sure that we upkeep our obligation towards the past. Five reasons why future generations are better off in our world. First claim from opening opposition, opportunity cost. Three responses. A, this is a huge principle slippery slope, right? Because if this is true, Shishti shouldn't be working on floral poetry. She should only be working on fucking malaria nets. I shouldn't be doing a social policy degree. I should only be investing in malaria nets. Like logically extending this ridiculous opportunity cost argument, everyone should stop doing everything and only invest in the long-term survival of every single person on the planet. It's a fucking ridiculous argument. Two, it assumes the same pot of money. Like, it's unclear to me why development aid is being cut for NASA. Realistically, what we're looking at is the science budget, for instance, goes more towards the Cancer Institute, goes more towards, for instance, GPS development. That funding is all funneled towards outer space exploration. It's unclear to me why money from malaria nets goes towards NASA. That never made sense to me. Number three, this also engages with our positive externalities about innovation and inspiration. And so far as if more technologies are created on our side and we inspire a new generation of scientists, that makes everyone significantly better off. The second claim from opening opposition is an intuition about complacency. That is the point at which you start working on outer space exploration, you might focus less on the planet. A, note that this can't possibly be true if we have more scientists and more scientific innovation, but taking them at their best, this claim also can't be true depending on what sort of things you're working on on planet Earth, right? So if you work on adaptation technologies, that might lead to mass complacency in the case of climate change. So it's unclear to me why this complacency on our side and not necessarily on their side. The third claim that I'm going to deal with is this sort of POI claim that came from CEO. But just to clarify, CEO, could I please engage with your extension? We are opening opposition. Go ahead. Quickly, right. though. It is theoretically possible that the ten dollars I give to charity might cause presumably might cause someone to die as a result of ingesting I don't know a bad mosquito of having a bad mosquito net. Does that make it more moral for me to spend the ten dollars on a Starbucks? That's the point. We don't know. That's exactly what I'm saying. You just said an intuition pump, but it's the same structural point. Let's talk about the third claim on their side, the idea of the ethics of interacting with other species, which is sort of the thing that came from CEO, but they gave me no opportunity to respond. You know, what if we find encounter another civilization? What happens then? Three things there. One, that has already identified to you that having more planets means more resources. Two additional responses. A, why should these species be part of our ethical circle? Like it's already existingly ambiguous why whether animals should be part of our existing ethical circle. Why should these species be treated any differently? So that claim is a bit of a non sequitur. They have to prove that that species is worthy of our moral concern. But two, this, co this interaction will go one of two ways, right? If they want to cooperate with us, we compound our benefits because now we can work with an advanced civilization. But if it doesn't want to cooperate with us, it wants to confront us then in self-defense, it is completely ethical for us to obliterate them because otherwise it will lead towards our obliteration. Finally, what were the benefits in this debate? Two, one, one track was we have to escape the planet. We showed you that climate change is capable and the habitability and population explosion is a huge problem. But we said even if these things aren't true, 
even if planet is earth is like paradise there are three additional reasons why you should still favor outer space exploration one infinite resource mining and this is extremely important because these resources aren't just coming from lots of planets they're coming from uninhabitable planets because the comparative in their fucking world is going to nigeria and drilling oil and systematically disenfranchising the very poor that they want to protect two there might be better habitats out there number of earth inhabitable planets are infinite in this world the chances of better earth out there is extremely important to us. Panel, we've shown to you that the externalities of the space exploration are positively numerous. And we've shown to you that there's a better path out there towards the cosmos. I am so proud to folks. We thank the speaker for the fine speech. And to close the top half of the debate, we call upon the deputy leader of opposition. Hear, hear. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, I can. All right, cool. Thank you. <clears throat> so I really want to drill this debate down to what exactly the decision being made here is. It is not about giving up infinite resources in space for the you know for 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 people right now. It is about the possibility of being able to access those infinite resources versus a guaranteed benefit to individuals now in terms of alleviating real suffering in the world today. And I think that's important because when it comes to allocating resources and the concept of duties, the reasons given by the Deputy Prime Minister do not stand to the extent to which they don't actually encompass the notion of uncertainty into the decisions that they are making about this moral culpability that presumably happens. So the first question then, um, infinitely numerous humanity in the future and why we should care about them. Um, again, I think to the extent to which all of their benefits for this infinite humanity is premised upon this thing working out, um, presumably if they believe that we're going to go extinct before we go extinct, and in a world where we're divide, diverting all the money towards things from geoengineering and like helping people adapt to like changing environmental conditions to space races, for example, then presumably we go extinct even faster. Then if that is the case, how can you guarantee that this infinite humanity will be helped in any way? I don't see where that duty comes from. But second, this notion of agency, they say future generations have no agency about the world that they are from, so we need to protect them to the best of our abilities. Again, first, like I don't really see why exactly you assume this is going to be protection, not just because you don't know what the outcomes are, but because I think Sean gave you structural reasons why the space race is going to be problematic anyway. But also, it's not as if we had any agency to be here in the first place, right? First of all, I definitely did not consent to be born. I would like to retract the decision that happened 26 years ago. But on top of that, I would argue that the precise conditions that we are in right now, i.e. the environment that we have to suffer through, the fact that we are facing extinction, and the situation and plight of millions of people around the world who are currently suffering from this environmental degradation is in itself not a result of their own agency either. So there's no reason really why exactly the agency of people in the future is any more than the agency that we have right now. The last thing is that I would just argue that most people currently don't really have um, agency anyway. Like to the extent to which you don't really determine what, the, what your skin color is when you were born, how smart you were, how you look, where you are, the access to resources that you might have. Like arguably, the redistribution of money from the government's coffers towards ensuring that you get better outcomes for yourself just in terms of being able to provide and alleviating your suffering is the best way of restoring agency and fairness to this world anyway. Last thing that I want to talk about is this, uh, and, and this uh, same argument, by the way, goes to the whole upkeeping of obligation to the past, because no one really said that the past people actually cared about us in any meaningful sense. The last thing I want to talk about is this uncertainty with regards to what happens if we fund the poor. So maybe we are funding the next great Malian dictator, um, and that's the big concern that they had on the opening opposition. Like, that might be true, but what I want to point out here is that just intuitively, in terms of the scale and probability of these things happening, that needs to be taken into consideration when we consider real guaranteed alleviation of suffering but and maybe that leads to worse consequences but how small that is and the guarantee at the very beginning of the benefit of alleviating that suffering versus huge probabilities of being able to like i don't know find the inhabitable the habitable planet in space so i think that's the moral issues in one corner the the thing that i therefore want to talk about now is perhaps the slightly more practical aspects this idea of microwave technology and why it was immensely helpful to people the thing is there's no actual argument from the opening government as to why these advances were unique to the space race that existed during the Cold War. Just presumably, like if people wanted to warm up their food, slash were looking at infrared technology already, 
in order to have some sort of like communication and think about things like satellites, none of these things necessarily required the space race. The only reason why they emerged from the space race was because at that point of time, they were pouring a ton of money into this specific field of scientific research. And this came out as an externality, but there was no reason. And there, there's still no reason to suggest why these things are in like, cannot be independent of your desire to go into space and have come about from other forms of research that have existed as well. In fact, arguably, you could probably have gotten more if you didn't waste so much money trying to put a man on the moon. Right, so now that that is done, I want to extend a little bit more on why we think that this duty right now is immensely important to individuals. The first of all is that we think that the quality of life of individuals just markedly becomes better. At the very least, even if we can't save everyone, which I suspect is what CG is going to talk about, we can guarantee that we save a number of people, a significant portion of them right now. And the reason for that is because we need to talk about where exactly this money comes from. The first thing I'll talk about is this money, when it comes up, this money comes from governmental budgets. It's not true that it's just about research funding. Presumably, if you want to invest heavily in this particular technology, you must also deal with the fact that this comes to the expect of other forms of creation. But also, taking money away from certain kinds of research is just bad in of itself. Like, presumably, this is research money that's going to deal with the exact existential problem that you're talking about. Things like geoengineering, things like, for example, building like dams uh, and walls that block like the worst excesses of these harms of environmental degradation from the people who are currently the most vulnerable. These are important investments that we need to make as opposed to trying to fight the space race. Right. Um, the last thing then I want to talk about is that the humanity of the future is quite speculative at best when you compare it themselves to the humanity today. So presumably the notion of humanity is quite an amorphous concept and it is one that's relied on the people who exist right now to be able to like even exist in the future for it to make sense. I'll take one from CG if you have one. Um, so in both worlds, it appears as though we need to leave the earth for reasons like climate change, poverty, things that don't seem to be fixed very soon. The comparative in CG is that we at least have a roadmap to getting started so that we can be prepared when the moment arrives. Like, what's the comparative in all? Yeah, no, I have also made many to do this in my life. Doesn't mean that I actually do them. I also still cannot guarantee that these things happen at the end of the day. But also, what Sean told you was incredibly important, which is to say that you can't guarantee that humanity as a huge like collective will like equally benefit from this particular outcome in that we argue that in the long process of the transition, even assuming that there is some ability for you to move, what's going to happen is increased inequality in terms of access to these very forms of technology. And if the truth is just that the most vulnerable people who are suffering the most right now have to suffer more in order to allow for the most privileged people to be able to escape on the back of this space technology, then we argue that that's the height of like just injustice and shouldn't be something that we support in this world. Um, very quickly, I just want to talk about these other civilization arguments. I think First of all, if you really believe in utilitarianism, I don't think either side gives us a real reason to really believe why humanity is better than other forms of intelligent life. Presumably, we're actually quite morally bad because we keep harming each other. So I would argue that this means that we do need a different civilization that has managed to survive until now for longer than us. Then we should probably respect them the way the Prime Directive does. But also just in general, contact with other species, for instance, just puts humanity at a lot of risk as well if you care about it, like pathogens that you were never able to research about that you cannot actually deal with, etc., etc. Just for all of these reasons, I think there are better things to do with our money than deep space research. I'm very happy to oppose. We thank the speaker for the fine speech and would now like to call upon the member of government here. here. Hello, can everyone hear me? Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. All right, give me a second. I'm gonna start my speech in three, two, one. So um, like the opening half of this debate very much centered around futures of humanity and people we should protect. There's someone we need to protect here, it's me because I'm being tortured by this motion. Um, I think there is a certain angle that we need to pursue in this debate, which is we need to have some recognitions of the realities that earth currently faces. Opening government suggested that the earth is dying, but they don't really give you any reasons as to why this is true or why that trend is irreversible. The most that they do is tell you in the prime minister that, oh, scientists say that we cannot do it. Like, okay, noted. Navin also can say it. That's not logical analysis or actual reasons as to why this is true. So let me begin with the first question of extension. Everything is interlinked. Why is the earth wrecked? And why is it that we cannot solve things? I have six reasons for this. 
The first is that capitalism on earth has gone to hell. This is to suggest capitalism has entrenched itself within earth and the infrastructures and the ecosystem of the earth such to an extent that we can no longer remove it from the way that we operate in our daily lives. So we all know that factories cause quite a bit of pollution. We all know that they cause quite a bit of climate change and also incurs many of the worst type of harms that climate change has to offer to us. But like we can't really do much about it at the moment because most of the global economy is very much contingent on the current infrastructure we have that directly links to climate change to begin with. So it's not that governments don't want to tackle climate change. It's just that governments don't have the capacity to deal with the what if. Like when the system is eventually erased, like what do we do to replace it? We don't seem to have the answers for it. That's the first reason why we can't save the earth because we literally don't have a solution to saving it to begin with. The second thing I'm going to say is this. I think humanity is pretty stupid. Uh, for most of the time, like we seem to be surviving on pure chance and odds that somehow it's a miracle we've made it this far. For instance, like climate change is an eminently imminent threat that is very visible, yet very large swathes of population don't believe in it for reasons such as anecdotal evidences of snow falling in their regions. These people end up becoming voters and voting in individuals like Trump. And like, I know he just lost, he still got 75 million people voting for him. That's a very big cause for concern. And I think that points towards a trend that humanity, our decision making and the people at the forefront of it, not very trustworthy. The last thing I'll say is, even when humanity is trustworthy, we're really unpredictable. And what this means is that somehow in like certain trends in history, we will be doing very well, but then there will be blips. For instance, Donald Trump's election in 2016, like sure, we could have avoided it, but the fact that it even happened to begin with suggests that humanity operates on an extent that we do well most of the time, but when we mess up, we really, really mess it up to the extent that we can't really fix it. We're literally gonna deal with all of the Trump administration's policies for the next 10 years, at the very least, I don't know if Biden's able to clean it up as well. The fourth thing I will say is that I think governments currently are swamped with many, many considerations and many dangerous situations that they need to fix. For instance, there's COVID, there's poverty. There are all these different things that require a wide spread of government attention that are seemingly going to take years or generations to fix at this rate. By the time we actually have effective climate change policy, for instance, it's probably going to be too late because we've surpassed the window of change that has been set in 2030 because it's just the reality that the biggest driver for change to reverse this irreversible trend is currently engaged in many considerations that are taking up its time as well. The fifth thing I will say is, and this is where I'm dealing with OO a bit, because OO's assumption is, we don't put the money in space, we put it in poverty aviation. Okay, my friends, in the developing world, there is a concept called corruption. Money goes missing. And the reason as to why a lot of governments cannot combat corruption, even in the most developed of societies, because the networks that surround them have become so entrenched within the political system that we are unable to distinguish between friend or foe. Like even the most eminent government officer could turn out to be someone taking kickbacks. But also number two, these networks of corruption have entrenched themselves with power structures, such to the extent that we literally cannot hold them accountable as well. Like this is an example, like in Malaysia, we elected Pakatan Harapan as a reformation government. They literally lasted for two years because individuals were able to orchestrate a coup government as well. My point is this, the current metrics of change on earth are also corrupted and are very subjected to evil incentives as well. And even when we try to fight them, we seem to be losing most of the time because they're just more well-funded than us, they're way more well-organized and they have better incentives. So... Okay, yeah, I think I'm basically, the earth is pretty bad. I don't think we're going to recover from it. Given this question and framing, this is the analysis that OG needed to prove, to prove that we have to leave to begin with. And I think this takes us above the opening government because we literally prove the biggest premise of their case, which is all contingent on us having to leave. I think I've proven it. We should take it over them at this point. The second frame I want to talk about is this. Given the earth is dying and we cannot reverse this trend, we are going to have to leave in some form or another. The question is, who currently dominates this industry? Right now, most of it is controlled by a singular company known as SpaceX that is controlled by Elon Musk. They are the ones that are making most of the advancements in terms of deep space explorations. And they are the only company, they are actually producing plans to take humanity to different plans and to find habitable places. The problem with this is that like all profitable 
and profit-driven corporations, they have negative incentive structures that only apply to specific groups of individuals. If governments don't enter this race right now, at the point in which that we eventually have to leave the earth, we are left with a singular entity that has singular control over this entire industry, and we are literally at their mercy. So I know opening opposite talk about obligation. I agree, there is an obligation. The obligation is to not potentially subject all of humanity to a singular company for their survival as well. That's how we deal with OO2. But before that, OO, you have a POI before six. Sorry, okay, so if it is true that humanity is so bad at making all of these decisions, what makes you think they'll be really good at making decisions about investigating space? Yeah, I think the reason is because we'll be traumatized from the earth dying. The fact that everything we said would happen actually happened on earth, that we saw oceans dry up, we saw the winds become so strong that infrastructure got blown apart. It's quite a traumatic thing. And I think that is very visceral reminders to humanity to make better decisions in the next home we're about to, meet, to land in. Now, the second thing I want to say is this. Um, so the first thing is, given governments enter the fray and they are able to develop companies, we have more equitable ways of going to space. So when we eventually leave, poor people won't be priced out because governments have nationalized services that can take them there. And we also have more accessible versions. So poor people aren't left to die on Earth. The last thing I'm going to say is this. Um, I think life is very hard on Earth. The reason is because there's not a lot of hope. Like if you look in every corner and aspect of humanity, most of it points to the fact that we're imploding on all fronts. And I think there are some people we need to cater to, which is just people who need something to live for. And I think in a world where we tell humanity that we could find a new home, this brings a breath of meaning to a lot of people's lives that they really need. When you're poor and when you have no food and the world is literally going to hell, the only thing you need to know is that there is a potential of a future outcome you can have as well. At the very least, CG gives that to them. Thank you. We thank the speaker for the fine speech. I would now like to call upon the member of opposition. Here, here. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes. Okay, just give me a second. Um, okay, before I start my speech, um, shout out to my uh, my friends and my girlfriend who stayed up until two in the morning to watch me debate in some godforsaken tournament on some godforsaken interface. Um, okay, so uh, I'm starting my speech in three, two, one. Uh, you can expect two very basic substantives from closing opposition. First, we're going to outline what these opportunity costs are, and we're going to explain why humanity is beset by all sides on existential threats. Secondly, we're going to explain why humanity will not be able to escape Earth in time and thus has an obligation to at least stave off these threats. Okay, before that though, direct responses to what I think are the most salient points of the Gov case. First, no team on Gov is justifying exploration into deep space, just that we should find another planet to move to except for the infinite resources stuff, which I will respond to later. I want to point out that, so by the way, the strict definition of deep space is interstellar space. So outside the bounds of our solar system. Insofar as we already have a planet right there named Mars that we can terraform using existing processes we've already outlined, it's insufficiently proven from closing government and opening government that this is the only way to escape the existential threats of Earth. Okay, secondly, Opening government says the opportunity cost argument is ridiculous. We might as well all be making malaria nets. Actually, why aren't you making a malaria net? In fact, I would suggest that Peter Singer is pretty cool. And in fact, inaction is really, really grave insofar as there are people out there that we just can't see but are dying because we're spending our time debating on this platform instead of using the money we use for Reg to let someone live and not die. Secondly, though, um, we also want to point out that the claim from closing government is quite ridiculous. If you're leaving a single corporation to take care of space, it seems to me an equally bad idea to leave oil corporations like Exxon and Shell to do the heavy lifting for climate change. They're like, yeah, guys, we got this. I'm sure that will go well. So insofar as both are reasonably bad, we suggest that you have to take care of the more imminent problems. Moving into substantive, firstly, 
Humanity is beset by all sides of by existential threats. So insofar as opening gov says that future pe- people are, are, are important, we broadly agree with that, but we will explain why these are more relevant to the interests of future people. There are four kinds of threats we are currently facing today. Firstly, global warming and climate change. Just to illustrate, if we go at the rate we are now, we expect hundreds of thousands to be displaced by rising tides and millions more to lose their livelihoods. Secondly, public health crises. Superbugs are slowly growing immune to our antibiotics due to industrial farming and systematic misuse of medicine. Bill Gates predicts that the first wave of superbugs will ravage populations on scales far on, on scales of magnitudes far higher than what we saw with coronavirus now. Thirdly, artificial intelligence says, our systems are currently vulnerable to rogue AI. It really only takes one to shut down the electrical grid of a country and to plunge everything into chaos. Fourthly, nuclear weapons and biological warfare, taking uh, taking something from the other motions in the other, room, in the other rooms. We want to point out that you only need one conflict to go awry to cause humanity to plunge into a crater. So... How does investing resources into these things fix these things? Firstly, we research ways into solving these things. Some of these problems are incredibly complex like artificial intelligence and superbugs. We would need considerable influence and money to be capable of researching ways to solve these things. And secondly, to exercise political capital to convince people to deescalate, surrender nuclear arms and whatnot. Why do we have more political capital and buying to solve these things than we do for space? Firstly, yes, space is really cool and looking at it is pretty wondrous, but it's only cool insofar as we invested resources in the space race to market it to young kids. I imagine it's similarly possible to romanticize sheltering humanity under the shining light of reason in opposition to the threats that beset it. But secondly, the impact areas we do concern ourselves with, such as global warming, such as global poverty, provide a moral urgency that is not there in space that can compel people to make large changes to their lifestyles already. Teenagers who have never seen an industrial factory in their life are still willing to go vegan in college. So what we illustrate to you is that there is a large untapped potential of potential scientists that could be willing to receive our funding and create innovations for the broader world. All these points are more relevant to the status quo because of the fact that their their time forecasting and the time horizon is within the next 20, 30 years. And insofar as it's unclear whether or not we'll actually get the space within that time, we think that these problems are more relevant. So we also think then that this political capital is exclusive in two ways. Firstly, opening government has a point on innovation. Presumably, you also get innovation on our side since we're still investing in R&D. Comparatively, though, their innovation or their inventions might incidentally benefit the vulnerable, like a microwave might accidentally help a poor person by chance. The purpose of ours is to actually do things like help people by making them breathe, by allowing them to breathe clean air in normally polluted and smog cities, by allowing them to not, you know, drown, by be- giving them better houses and better ways to adapt to climate change. Secondly, I think this is a fair concern from opening gov. What if they say we're pulling from different funds anyway? The first thing to note here is that people have limited appetites for voting for public funding because it pulls away at their budget for important things that they might care about in their own lives, such as, I don't know, food and water. So insofar as you increase funding in one way, even if they might be in different budgetary concerns, you still have to consider, you still have to contend with the fact that people lower their appetite for funding. But secondly, these are probably in the same funds given that these organizations are donating to like large, like to, to international organizations in the first place. So they're probably kept within the same fund. So these points prove that the opportunity cost is not there, uh, sorry, is there and is immensely lost. And given that these existential threats are more relevant, we should win already on these impacts. Before I before I go, I'll take a point from OG. Darby, if you're trying to have your cake and eat it too, your response to us is help the kids with the malaria, let's do intuition. But your extension is let's do extinction risk research. It can only be one or the other, right? Uh, well, the point is, is that if we don't, if we need malaria nets, but we also need to ensure that you know people aren't drowning, we probably. We, I think it's enough to assert that people losing their homes to rising tides are about equally as compelling as malaria nets. Whereas getting marginally more resources and having a slighter chance of, of fixing these things is less compelling. Anyway, so thirdly, we'll also respond on the principle level to opening government. Uh, so the first is they say that an, uh, we have obligations to the future. We also think that an international space organization has obligations to the interests of humanity now in three key ways. Firstly, it stakes a claim over these people insofar as it uses up mutually exclusive resources, harnessing, harnessing the minds of the world's brightest to do things that don't directly benefit the rest of the world, takes away the expertise that you, do, you could have used otherwise. Secondly, current suffering is instantiated and present. Your obligation to these people is stronger because it is grounded in action 
as opposed to you potentially acting in the future to help these people since you're, the opportunity cost of action hasn't been presented to you yet, whereas the opportunity cost for people suffering now is presented to you now. Thirdly and lastly, it also takes resources from these people, either by taxation or by discretionary funds from various states. Insofar as we allow humanity to survive more due to the more compelling problems currently faced by people, as well as allow the future of humanity to survive by like giving them space to breathe before you can even consider going to Mars, we think we already win this debate. But the last thing I'm going to say is, I mean, this is kind of a throwaway, but if we're going to genocide alien races, humanity should probably just die. So for these reasons, negate. We thank the speaker for the fine speech. And now to close the case for that side of the house, we call upon the government whip. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Uh, you are to me, yes. Thank you so much. The problem with the entirety of the op bench and frankly every other team in this debate is I don't think they necessarily explain to us the process with regards to how you're going to galvanize change when people are despondent, have already accepted a dystopia in the world right now, which very much is like a capitalist world where we've enslaved ourselves to cop capitalist superstructures and have lost agency on various fronts because of the fact that the world around us is dying and everyone is selfishly motivated to just try and hoard resources. There is no explanation or opposition with regards to why people People are likely going to opt for things like wanting to increase malaria nets, wanting to stop ExxonMobil from like oil rigging and etc. But ex apart from the fact that just saying that this is a potential cost that's likely going to be incurred as a consequence of us taking this policy. So my speech is going to be quite simple. I'm just going to talk uh, very quickly with regards to why Naveen's extension wins us this debate. And then I'm going to quickly engage with closing opposition. Uh, and I'm going to talk about opening opposition uh, with regards to why I think uh, if we do end up just trying this, and even if we end up failing in the process, why at the very least we are able to get some degree of like 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 comfort and like why this then also means that we are able to in the event we do have success we are able to sort of like ensure that we don't have an extremely manipulative and exploitative first mover advantage by an extremely adverse and perverse actor firstly with regards to um closing opposition a very quick response before i weigh out why our material weighs against their material i will flag out however that i'm absolutely uncertain as to what uh, closing opposition's extension is just a bunch of responses let me try and see and engage with the most contentious stuff. The first thing that they say is that apparently Exxon is going to be harming the environment as a consequence of us abandoning this and uh, opting to like, for example, explore into space. I think Navin already gives you an extension, six structural reasons to explain to you why everyone is dystopian and despondent and are fatigued from trying to fight this and are oftentimes lost. There is no explanation as to how, it's how we have a capacity to fight things like, for example, corporate lo lobbying because it would re literally require countries like, for example, Russia, America, and China to re final resources that we're now putting into deep uh, space exploration to like literally like like ask corporations to stop doing what they are doing. I'm um, answered as to why countries which are literally benefiting from capitalist superstructures right now in the short run are going to opt for this. Biden literally couldn't even give up freaking fracking in like the election processes. I'm answered to why they're going to want to reform the entire world. So for these reasons, I don't think the actual trade-off is like ExxonMobil being able to like, like be, be reconciled and rectified under our world. Extension material and why we weigh over them. Let me build this a bit more and, uh, and impact this a bit more. The first thing that Navin tells you is that the world is freaking hopeless for a couple of reasons. Number one, capitalism. Number two, humanity is pretty stupid and circular. We keep making unpredictable and pre predictable mistakes and we're wonky. Number three, that oftentimes governments are swamped with many concerns that we're answering as to how we're going to fight these concerns because it's too freaking late. We have no path process on how we're going to do this. There's no window of change. There's no literal like, like ability and opt-in from people on the ground because people feel like there's no point trying to fight it because we have things like, for example, the doomsday clock telling us that the end is already here and there's no like a, a other thing in the world apart from the end just being near in plain sight. And people just giving up things like, for example, wanting to become vegan or wanting to become more ethical because the world is going to die anyway. The only thing that could potentially fix this mindset is some version of hope, some ray of sunshine of believing that perhaps down the road, there's some ability for us to envision the life of the humanity proceeding and being better than the version that we're seeing in right now. Without this literal promise and the ability to envision this and to be able to tell people this, we aren't able to get any ability to sort of fix the world that we're in right now. And that's why we tell you when we opt into this, it's not just like us 
like proactively doing this for no reason. There is literally an adversarial threat right now uh, and competitive forces that are trying to get this first and to try and like get the first mover's advantage in space. This is especially important because Namin tells you that if you don't do this, in the event that we do, for example, find things like um, another planet that could be terraformed. And I think CEO is quite smart in pointing out that Mars is right there and we could terraform it. But the reason why we haven't terraformed it is because it's freaking expensive. Oxygen levels are extremely like difficult for us to regulate. Terraforming means like, like having to like, like regulate and like go on there and like do a bunch of things like there may be a possibility that beyond the solar system that we ex that we exist in, there is another planet that maybe shares some similar characteristics to Earth or some similar characteristics to Mars, but is more of able to be terraformed. In a world where you have corporations getting control of this, like for example, Elon Musk being the first person to have access to this, you have no ability to democratize access for people to have access to this. What is likely going to happen? You're not going to be able to control things like, for example, legislation on this new planet. You have no ability to have control with regards to who and what type of life people are going to have on this planet is very likely that I think corporations that have control over this are likely going to bring people over there at the expense of perhaps making them to some extent slaves to a superstructure in a new planet and like for example trying to manipulate and exploit them as well because they are literally trying to escape world and corporations can literally use this as a manipulative tool to get you to do things that you otherwise wouldn't want up to a worse version of life. So it'd be extremely freaking sad because you would find another planet the corporation would take this but it would literally make a second dystopia where somebody could just like have capitalism 2.0 and literally exploit people as well. The only way in which we can fix this or at the very least have some degree of democratized process or increase the time period in which we can like, engage and make this a lot more constructive is by having countries up into this. That's why specifically we think we're able to do that only in the world we have we funnel money into this. Let's, let me also quickly engage with opening our position. There are two things that opening our position says. Firstly, with regards to the trade-off and the cost that you lose because you end up like having to like lose money with regards to building infrastructure. The first thing I would say is we don't actually waste like a significant significant amount of resources because unlike opening government, it's like un strategic for you to just want to like extract resources from like planets. I think that would be extremely expensive. But I do think there are ways in which you can do like, for example, like use technology that we have like the Hubble telescope to literally like re-engineer it to look further into space or send, for example, like a Voyager part like two to go and go further into space and etc. There are ways in which we can get the hope without necessarily incurring an extreme cost. Like for example, wanting to extract resources and like, like make life better on Earth right now. We don't have to incur the same type of cost as opening government. But also I think it's important to as well that there's a competitive threat here so although there's a trade-off for life right now here there's also a trade-off for the future life and not really future as like future of opening government but i think future in like the foreseeable maybe 100 or 150 years as well and i think some people are likely going to live until then as well but secondly with regards to the idea of quality of life i think navi makes it very clear that corrupt structures exist and oftentimes any attempt to try and fix life right now in the system that we live in right now does not allow for us to ensure that this trickles down to the people on the ground this corruption does not exist for things like space travel because number one one, the people on the forefront are developed countries like America, Russia, and China who are likely not going to want to like be corrupt because they're not developing nations that struggle from this and are not the people who are trying to get malaria help too. But I think secondly also like it's not very boring and like, it's the only option that's like to save the world that's not boring like for example going vegan or like completely fixing like the world and making it carbon negative. I think for all these reasons they are more likely going to want to opt to this and not be corrupt. So for these frank reasons and because we don't incur extreme costs and we can still get some degree of hope, we think this this is the only way in which we can confirm and get people to work and be able to envision a future for themselves. For all other reasons, we think people will be despondent and dystopian. Thank you. Thank the speaker for the fine speech. And now to conclude the case of us out of the house and indeed the debate as a whole, we call upon the opposition whip here, here. Hello, testing my microphone. Can I be heard properly? I can hear you, yes. All right, thank you so much. Um, I prefer my POIs in the, in the chat. Yes, it is my mom's birthday. All right, um, so I'm going to watch the chat for any POIs. If you want to raise a POI, I'm going to watch the chat. So I'm going to start my speech in a few seconds. Starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. So to briefly respond to this conspiracy theory from the government whip that Elon Musk is going to monopolize the deep space research industry and suddenly like take over many different planets and get all the resources for himself and exploit the world for himself and become world leader. Two responses. Number one, China and India exist. 
uh, they have their own space programs. The United States has their own space programs. SpaceX relies on them for technology. Like I'm actually kind of helping government with their own regulations for this. This is an endemic reality. This is not going to be the worst case scenario. But secondly, if he's going to try to do this substantially, it's going to be unpopular with the vast majority of individuals in the world. He wants to become popular. There's no reason for why this is going to be true. Issue. Why is this the most important consideration in this debate? And what is the most important consideration for humanity? So I really want to make this the only framing issue in this debate because there are many competing claims that many people were throwing around, that especially the claim on climate change, the claim on the existential threat to humanity. I want to address what, what, what deep space research particularly does in relation to this context and how it affects the public. Opening opposition hinges their case on the low probability of success of this research, that it is very speculative, and that there are more guaranteed benefits in being able to, as much as possible, help and alleviate the suffering of individuals today through poverty or being able to give them a lot of amelioration. Opening government and closing government say that substantially, climate change and other different forces such as capitalism, like closing government highlights, are things that are inescapable and are often going to become worse and worse and make the quality of life more and more harmful for individuals. And therefore, the best option we have now is to explore the deep space and to as much as possible get more resources, like OG says, or at CG says, like at least have some safety net in the future. What we did at Closing Opposition to highlight and understand the deep space mechanism that they are particularly needing to focus on the most in the speeches, not just the problem analysis, but focusing on the link as to why the research is likely to become better and better and lead to more infinite resources, is not just talking about why it's unnecessary or speculative, like oh said, but we added the following comparative claims. And I think I just want to highlight this, right? Like Closing Government's case largely relies on some anti-natalist conception of the world that we are absolutely hopeless that we're never going to be get, go, become better because we're already ingrained with the social mindset of capitalism and therefore we're going to self-destruct in the future obviously like i just want to appeal to your sense of co like common sense right and say that the world can be better than that there are some ways we can alleviate it and that's what i'm going to do in the speech firstly to the extent that capitalism does hijack many economic structures in the world today, and to the extent that many individuals do rely on their livelihoods for many jobs and many different individuals that are in working in those corporations, I, I still say that deep space research and technology is not a reset. It's not a restart of like you know, starting over with capitalism or starting over with another capital or economic structure in another world, or just intuitively, you're not restarting like, like starting from point zero in climate change in the world today or even in Earth, or you're not going to have further climate change in other worlds that you're using, especially if the same forces and the same incentives are exacerbated from those corporations anyway. So if you are delaying the death of humanity in another pernicious way like it's gonna be worse on your world you're gonna take more and more years to speculate and research on that technology but the other comparative is is that the world that we have now which is probably as OO says is guaranteed substantially feels the effects of most of these arguments but I think the other thing I want to highlight is that this is a window that shifts the expectations the forecasting the beliefs of the public already in the earth now and at least the many corporations that will opt in to want to bid for their different access to mining in the industries that they want to talk about in their side, the expectations that individuals will hold will shift and become more pernicious for the following reasons. Number one, there are going to be more willing to tolerate bad corporations in our world. And to the extent that they are already harmful, they have incentives to self-preserve in a world that already is depleting, that is going to get worse because obviously you want to have long-term viability. Two, you always want to understand that states want like have incentives to fund scientific technology in all realms, like even long-term climate, like climate preservation technology that is necessary for many states to function. This is substantially defunded if you believe opening government's mechanism that you want to inspire a new generation of scientists that is substantially in a different field of science. And I know their response would be, no, 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 we can have interlinkages with different scientific methods, but that isn't possible if you are relying all on deep space research, which is the most unexplored like scientific knowledge there compared to the other guaranteed scientific methods that we know today, such as through neuroscience or being able to cli or climate research or being able to stop super, super, super viruses from developing in the future or being able to mitigate the worst effects of nuclear research or nuclear technology and weapons of mass destruction, which are all nearer, more approximate harms that uh, David identified in his speech. And note that we're not just rehashing OO. We are identifying a clear 
clear comparative as to why these problems are much clearer and more identifiable and why the possibility of research and innovation uniquely identified through this technology, uh, absent the technology of these space research, is able to alleviate these problems the most because you are defunding those other scientific pursuits and making it harder for you to access those particular per per problems for individuals. I think that's a better, more nuanced mechanism that directly responds to OG, but also um, responds to the problems that CG has in terms of how human calculus looks like. Um, I want to take a few eye from OG. Again, either your responses are true, which are in line with the spirit of opening opposition who talk about a moral focus on the present, or your extension is true, which Loki knights OO and talks about how we should care about future generations. Only one of them can so be true, I Oh wait, so I, I I don't think that I'm knifing OO at all. Like I think like just saying that if you really want to care about future generations, it is done through the precedent of caring for the now and being able to as much as possible invest in scientific pursuits that are near problems and more approximate and more identifiable and much clearer. So I think to the extent that you say that you have an obligation to the future because you like, you know you are um, affected by the past, et cetera, et cetera. Like I think that the obligation like doesn't exist on that basis of agency. You should care for the people who are more approximate and more clear and more identifiable with this model that we identified it with or with the problems that we said. The last response I want to make is in terms of our responses on political capital. And like government whip's response to our argument is that it's symmetric. We're going to have a lot of political capital anyways. We are likely to have a lot of individuals like substantially invest in this technology for deep space research. And that's not true. Like look at the problems that many individuals do face that are more visceral to them, such as the threats of many states being able to lose their autonomy, many states being at the threat of different typhoons and natural disasters, or the threat of you know, impending climate change that is very approximate to them. And obviously, to the extent that these are things that they are, that they can forecast, that they know that are problems for them, I think that deep space research detracts from that, highlights an entirely separate problem, makes it difficult for you to invest in those particular more approximate problems, and therefore makes it harder for all states to cooperate or even the scientific community to agree on why this is most important to address. So to the extent that, again, dangers will exist on either side of the house, we identify why our problems are the ones that you should prioritize the most and why the worst case is just significantly worse on their side. For us and more, very proud to oppose. We thank the speaker for a fine speech. Thank all of you for an excellent debate. Um, I can only I can only kind of assure you that there is a round of applause somewhere in the ether uh, for all of this. Uh, we're going to deliberate now. Uh, you know, very well done, everyone, and good luck for the for the break breakish. You know, nothing. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.